Music has the power to make or break any media property. You can have great films or TV series with a lackluster and unmemorable score. You can have weaker films or TV series with a commanding and arresting score that overshadows the quality of the content itself. And you can have bad movies or TV series where the music is certainly not doing any favors to save it or even stand out. Andor manages to maintain a perfect synergy between what's happening on screen and what is being relayed through its music, with both elements managing to excel on their own and rise into the stratosphere when brought together. In starting out my attempt to convey a general overview of what makes Andor's score so brilliant, I thought I'd try comparing it against the score for the Obi-Wan series. I promise this is not just something I shoehorned in as a desperate attempt to deal low blows toward what I perceive as the quality of that series, though there certainly will be some of that, and still navigating the practice of discussing music and film and television as I am by no means a professional musician, I thought it would be sensible to attempt a comparative approach, highlighting both ends of the spectrum between two very similar media properties as a means of introducing the ways and or succeeds, contrasted against where the Obi-Wan series absolutely falls flat, at least in terms of its music. I promise to keep the section as brief as possible, as we will be diving into the specifics of Andor's music and how exceptional it is within the context of the series itself right after this. And apologies in advance if I sound a bit off in my phrasing of things here for any music aficionados out there. As much as I love listening to and discussing music from video games, TV series, and movies, I'm still learning more about the specific terminology and such as I go along. And yeah, that's right. After discussing Andor already for an hour and a half in my part 1 video, which you should watch before this one as there are several links and references to be drawn between them, I couldn't help myself from revisiting this series one last time to ensure I finally got to admire it from every aspect of its brilliance that I didn't get to cover in the first part. So let's get into it. Starting with the Obi-Wan series, the most glaring issue you have going into it when it comes to its music is the fact that the iconic John Williams returned to compose Obi-Wan's theme, and thereby the theme for the entire series, but then didn't go on to contribute to any other aspect of the score for the series. It makes perfect sense why Disney would decide to bring John Williams back to compose a theme for Obi-Wan, given that he has composed a theme custom to literally every other major character in the Star Wars franchise. And from what I've read, it was very cathartic for him to be able to do so. It is equally cathartic listening to the theme as it is a breathtaking encapsulation of the various defining traits of Obi-Wan as a character, and sets high expectations for what to expect from the series. It is both somber and triumphant, and offers a glimmer of hope through the darkness of which Obi-Wan finds himself surrounded by at this point in the Star Wars timeline. It starts off with a very strong and memorable pairing of motifs that carry throughout the composition, before building to a riveting and adventurous verse of strings and horns in perfect synchronicity. It then falls off into a more melancholic and reflective bridge, before gradually building to an exciting crescendo into its final verse, calling back the motifs from the opening and building upon them in a climactic way. Like all of John Williams' work, it is just exceptional, and you can feel every bit of the passion and inspiration behind it. This theme perfectly fits the character it was written for, but the series itself is another story. The score for the Obi-Wan series as a whole, outside of its theme, was composed primarily by Natalie Holt. And Natalie previously did some fantastic work on the Disney Plus series Loki, but here completely misses the mark in my opinion. 
This isn't meant to disparage Natalie as a composer, and as we all know, taste in music in general is subjective. But to me, the music in the Obi-Wan series completely lacks any spark of inspiration behind its creation. The best word I could use to describe the score as a whole is meandering, or simply forgettable. Wandering aimlessly through derivative beats that achieve the bare minimum necessary to attempt to convey emotion behind what's happening on screen, but lacks the proper arrangement and momentum to actually do so. And having listened to the entire score twice, I'd say about 90% of the tracks blended together with no defining memorable qualities, and the remainder stood out for very much the wrong reasons. Brief spoiler warning on the Obi-Wan series here. But if you've seen it, you understand that the two pivotal scenes in the series that absolutely had to work even if nothing else did, in order to make it a worthwhile endeavor for longing fans to sit through, were the first duel between Vader and Obi-Wan in Episode 3, and their final duel in the last episode. These confrontations were the entire catalyst behind the series' creation, and the only reason anybody took time to sit down and watch it, if we're being honest. These two contrasting scenes representing Obi-Wan at his lowest point to then introduce a redemption arc toward retribution in the final battle, when he is more powerful and capable, absolutely had to go off without a hitch. And without getting into the weeds about the quality of the show itself, the music did not accomplish this goal. Not even close. In fact, when I was listening to the music they decided to go with during the first duel between Obi-Wan and Vader that fans had been waiting over 15 years for in burning anticipation, I almost had to turn it off and stop watching out of frustration. I felt slighted, like the creative minds behind this moment had no care for the pop cultural weight behind it finally happening, even if it never really needed to happen. Both of the songs used during these duels are completely lacking in terms of that same spark of excitement that should have been carried over from the amazing theme for the series. They just string along a series of notes that attempt to convey an emotion and pull together bits and pieces of past Star Wars arrangements, while being almost completely devoid of any defined movements or development capable of delivering it. These songs don't build toward anything, they just go on and on in search of something that never arrives, and then they just end. The particularly egregious offender here being a track titled I Will Do What I Must, which begins playing at the start of the climactic duel between Vader and Obi-Wan in the final episode, or as I like to refer to the song as Wish.com Duel of the Fates. It desperately attempts to emulate the grand ambitions of better music to terrible results, featuring a half-asleep choir and the saddest horn I've ever heard in a song. To me, the greatest fault of the score for Obi-Wan is its lack of consistency, both between the theme and the rest of the score, and with how it never manages to establish any memorable motifs to carry throughout. It doesn't carry any element of the main theme into its own creation, nor does it create any memorable ones of its own, which I find to be an absolutely fatal mistake. Why create this amazing theme and then completely abandon it in all other aspects of the score? It robs the music of any foundation to build off of, and as a result the score just devolves into a scattered array of songs that attempt to telegraph what someone should feel in any given moment, without ever defining themselves with something that feels as earned or triumphant as the theme. There are also, admittedly, no memorable characters besides Obi-Wan, Vader, and young Leia, and therefore no unique character themes in the series. Each song ends as quickly as it began, with very little diversification in terms of instrumentation or range, resulting in the entire score blending together into an uninspired mishmash of derivative mediocrity. And so, and finally looping back to Andor, you know, the series you clicked on this video for, we can now look more closely at why its music is so brilliant through the lens of how it manages to correct the missteps of the Obi-Wan series. Andor's score was composed by Nicholas Bertel, who worked on award-winning scores for movies and TV series such as Moonlight, Succession, and, uh, Cruella? Brittell has a lot of heavyweight work and experience under his belt that translates well to Andor, but to date he had never taken on a project quite like Andor in terms of budget, scope, and cultural legacy. Instead of being locked down under ball and chain to the entrapments of having a theme composed by a legend, and having to pretend to emulate a score that can match it, 
Rattel was given full creative freedom to craft an entirely unique soundscape of his own choosing for Andor. Reading through the Variety article that features all the arduous work Rattel put into crafting the score for Andor, which I'll have linked in the description, really just brings another layer of great appreciation toward how deep he dug into his creative passions to construct a truly singular series of unified compositions. The Mad Lad actually went on to compose a whopping 91 tracks for the Andor score across three volumes, totaling over seven hours of music composed for the series. And through it all, every character, environment, and dramatic moment is given its own unique flavor of music that both complements and elevates what is happening on screen. Starting first and foremost with the theme for the series, as great as it is to have one really strong main theme to carry throughout the start of each episode, as it was in Obi-Wan, Andor has 12. Yeah, Brittell in his deranged lunacy decided to take the main theme of the series and manipulate it into 11 separate derivatives emblematic of what to expect from the episode they were composed for. They were uniquely created for each episode to both portray and foreshadow the course of Cassian's journey through self-discovery, and what to expect of the reactive world around him. Do you really think any audience member is going to notice this stuff? I think whether you consciously notice things is, is actually not, not my hope you know, and it's working on an emotional level. While these themes may not quite reach the heights of John Williams' theme for the Obi-Wan series, it doesn't need nor try to. Much like the series itself, Andor's theme stands on its own and clearly defines the tone the series is going for right from the start of each episode. Andor also then capitalizes on the shortcomings of the Obi-Wan series by integrating the main theme into the very fabric of the series' score. We'll get more into specifics later on, but key motifs from Andor's theme can be heard multiple times throughout the series, often used as a foundation to build off of in moments of redemption or payoff. Andor's score exhibits extreme versatility in its ability to both convey genuine emotion and also inspire creative momentum through several diverse arrangements of instrumentation, featuring a creative mix of heavy orchestra, synthesizers, and other abstract sound samples. There's no clearer example of Brittell's painstaking effort in constructing the score than the fact that he even went so far as to have the score mirror the various arcs of the series itself as they were laid out in my part one video on the series. Each arc is accompanied by a unique suite of cohesive and consistent, both within the arc and across the entire series, tracks that convey the same sense of progression and variation as these individual arcs do in their narrative. And most importantly, Andor actually has a unique and interesting cast of characters characters outside of the protagonist, thereby serving as motivation behind Brittell's decision to compose a theme, or even a sequence of themes, for each of them. In Andor, great care was taken by Brittell to create a synergy between the narrative and the score, in a way that allows for the score to tell a story all on its own, an exceptionally rare feat that requires a great deal of planning and coordination between the composer and other creative leads. Instead of the music feeling tacked on to each scene and achieving the bare minimum necessary to get a point across, Andor's score reaches deep into the mythos of the series it plays against, to obtain a truly towering musical achievement that deserves far more praise than I feel it has received to date. And so now, let's evaluate the specifics behind the brilliance of the music in Andor. As I already mentioned in the introduction, one of the greatest strengths of Andor's score is how it manages to remain consistent and familiar despite covering such a wide variety of settings, plot scenarios, and emotional arcs. Each narrative arc of the series carries with it an arrangement of songs embracing a unique tone and set of instrumentation that perfectly fits with the tone of the narrative and setting. The Origins arc, for example, is very stripped down and tribalistic, featuring lots of drumming, clanging cymbals, and ambient noises as we navigate through the streets of Ferex in parallel with exploring Cassian's backstory on Canari. 
We then transition to the ever-increasing tension of the Aldani heist arc that is complemented by a suite of tracks that are very heavy, oppressive, cinematic, and operatic, gradually building with anticipation and reflective of the foreboding dangers the team faces on all ends as the heist draws closer. The prison arc represents the most dramatic shift in tone for the series, and likewise, the score takes a sharp left turn where the music sounds very, um, spacey? for lack of a better word, and very reminiscent of something like the Mass Effect soundtrack. This arc almost feels entirely detached from the rest of the series and self-contained, but there are elements of the narrative and the music that keep us grounded and remind us of the series' roots. Rattel understands that you don't want to have every track sounding too similar to one another and blending together, so the music in this arc likewise undergoes a dramatic and revitalizing shift. But the tracks in the prison arc still manage to remain consistent with one another in order to establish a baseline of familiarity while also featuring callbacks to the previous arcs. For example, despite the dramatic departure in tone with music that we encounter within the prison, the music we hear outside of the prison sounds more similar to how it was in previous arcs. Rattel creates a masterful contrast between the microcosm of the prison as a self-contained setting and the quote-unquote normalcy of what is occurring outside of it. It's a great show of versatility to keep things fresh while also harnessing elements of familiarity as a foundation. And the theme which opens each episode sprawls out into the music for the episode with bits and pieces carried into it as appropriate. So even if the music we are hearing in one arc feels fundamentally different from what preceded it, there is still consistency between the tracks and the current arc, as well as consistency with previous arcs that came before, in the way that it gradually manages to rework familiar themes and motifs from episode to episode. This is an absolutely critical element that contributes to the cohesion which manages to hold the series together, and suggests that great care and thought was putting into making Andor feel like a fully rounded, thoroughly planned series, with a defined beginning, middle, and end, as opposed to a scattered series of 12 episodes with no real through line between them. The music is a huge part of what holds Andor together as a series, and a lot of its inherent brilliance stems from how music is used to underline its core cast of characters. Powerful character-based storytelling is yet another one of Andor's greatest strengths as a series. Having a well-rounded cast of inherently complex and intriguing individuals falling on varying ends of moral ambiguity lends itself to breathing life into a series with so much more going on under the hood than its simple premise and one-word title would suggest. And when it comes to music, careful consideration was placed into how each of our core characters would be portrayed. Again, the consistency we mentioned in the previous part plays a major role here too, as once the groundwork is set for the character in establishing their theme, hints of it follow the character like a low-hanging cloud through each and every scene that they are featured in. Starting with Cyril Karn, for example, in episode 4 we get the full rendition of his introductory theme titled Cyril Sweet. It is consistently rhythmic like a metronome or a soldier marching in place with a very strict, deliberate, and logical path to follow. Cyril's theme reflects his nature as an individual who is both a systemic cog in a much greater machine, but is also imbued with an inherent curiosity and sense of purpose that drives him forward, even through his lowest point. The song ends by breaking out of this rhythmic metronome and giving way to a sense of uncertainty as to what lies ahead. Much of exploring Cyril as a character revolves around how he may redeem himself after being bested by Cassian, and flirts with subtle questions about whether Cyril's allegiances truly ought to lie with a power such as the Empire that consistently undercuts and undervalues his ingenuity and capacity to challenge authority. It is no mere coincidence that some episodes even open with a melancholic undertone of the episode's theme, leading into a depiction of Cyril shriveling under the weight of his self-assured, yet wasted, potential. In the Origins arc, the score derives subtle cues and stingers from the Cyril suite, as Cyril remains rampant in his search for Cassian, but later, following his downfall, the music surrounding his character focuses more around that uncertain, somber endpoint of the suite, as he continues to evaluate where he belongs in the midst of a situation that has left him feeling lost and insignificant. Although Cyril is often depicted as being doggedly subservient to the idea of maintaining order on behalf of the Empire, there is a significant undertone
tone, suggesting Cyril is ultimately operating on the behalf of a personal vendetta and wanting to prove himself and be recognized. Luckily, Cyril's theme and its various derivatives sprinkled throughout the series leave room for an open-ended interpretation of a character that, despite his meek appearance, has no problem commanding a situation as necessary in service of his fierce dedication to his own self-worth and perhaps, by extension, the Empire. Though I can't help but wonder if this is rather meant to plant the seeds towards Cyril defecting from the Empire in Season 2. Guess we'll find out in 2028. On the flip side, Dedra Miro operates as a towering shadow over everything Cyril wishes he could become. Cyril fawns over her place and power, yet the ironic part is that he is portrayed as being equally capable as Dedra, exhibiting frighteningly similar qualities and tenacity to such an extent that one could easily confuse them as siblings. Cyril sees himself as worthy of equal footing, but through an unfortunate contrast and circumstance, finds himself having to clamor his way back into a position of value, and clenches onto Dedra as his pipe dream for being able to do so. Dedra, however, unlike Cyril, does not have her own theme. So who's the big empire baddie now, huh? Take that, Dedra! I think the possible reasoning behind this, though, makes a lot of sense. Whenever music is cued in relation to her arrival or something she is doing, it is a derivative of the towering and imposing theme that plays whenever the Imperial Security Bureau is on screen or introduced, which could perhaps be emblematic of her being less of her own character in this season and instead a physical embodiment of the hunt and ever-growing presence of the ISB. Unlike like Cyril, she has no real humanizing character moments in the series other than the very end when she's saved by Cyril. We don't get to know who Dedra is as a person outside of her fierce dedication to her work and an unjust cause. She becomes Empire Incarnate, and a worthy antagonist for the series, and having developed from a point of likewise starting at or near the bottom, and having to prove herself into a position of importance. I find it fascinating how two woefully similar characters like Cyril and Dedra somehow find themselves on the opposite ends of the spectrum, in terms of role and status, only to realize in their final scene together that their status or superfluous perceptions of self-importance don't hold any meaning in light of a war that devours all who touch it. An eye-opening and sobering moment for both of them and all who held their ground on Ferrix that one ill-fated day. Speaking of people that held their ground on Ferrix that ill-fated day... Luthen Rael is yet another one of Andor's fascinating complex characters that skirts the lines of moral ambiguity throughout a black box with constantly shifting motivations, and it isn't until near the end of the series that we truly begin to understand what really drives him, and even then, we can't entirely be sure. This much is therefore reflected in his theme, or, in this case, pairing of themes, which represent the contrasting sides of his character. In terms of music, we're first introduced to Luthen with a track simply titled Luthen Rael. It is determined, heavy, and intense, just as we are meant to perceive him with how he presents himself in the heat of intense negotiations and battles. Luthen effortlessly commands those around him to his own will and is both well informed and certain of how every scenario he enters into will play out. An almost omniscient presence strategically moving pieces into place. But that's not all there is to Luthen. What makes Luthen a compelling character is not his badass ability to envision every outcome and calmly navigate even through the worst of them, but rather the cracks that give way to his humanity. Despite being frighteningly effective and efficient to an almost unbelievable extent, Luthen is still portrayed as a regular human being with feelings and emotions like any other character in the series. Luthen's second theme, Luthen of Coruscant, therefore, hints further at the damaged, aching ghost that lives beneath the facade that he presents to the world. The song is a deconstructed, saddening rendition of the Luthen Rael track that preceded it, and it underlines one of the few moments in the series where we are shown who Luthen really is. And it also happens to be one of my favorite scenes in all of Andor, despite only lasting a minute. On his ship, Luthen begins putting on the disguise he dons whenever spending time on Coruscant. We are shown him carefully placing and arranging every piece of his outfit, including an illustrious wig, as he prepares to blend in with the high and mighty of the galaxy's capital. He stares at the mirror and smiles with a slight decorative flourish, before the smile gives way to a stern expression of indifference and exhaustion as he walks out of frame. 
It's such a simple scene, and yet it offers so much perspective in peeling back the curtain, and offering a grounded means of fleshing out a character who would otherwise remain entirely a mystery to the viewer. This scene and the theme music that plays alongside it, paired with a few select moments of humanizing characterization to follow, help depict Luthen as more than just a one-dimensional servant of the Rebellion, or a brutish manipulator. Akin to what his monologue in episode 10 would imply, this single piece of music effectively manages to illustrate Luthen as a mere husband of his former self. Riddled with guilt and sacrifices, he has long since buried, as he has devoted himself entirely to a cause greater than himself. Now the only humanity of him that we are able to see is shown behind closed doors, through a mirror as he dresses into a costume that merely masks the mask that he wears to hide his eternally lost soul. And like all characters in the series, Luthen is one born of tragedy, in a way that further allows the viewer to sympathize with them despite them carrying motivations that may directly contradict those of the protagonist or, furthermore, traditional moral boundaries. Through this lens, we may not agree with Luthen's decisions, but we are better equipped to understand them. Perhaps the most tragic character in the series, Mon Mothma, carries with her a theme that perfectly encapsulates the daggers gradually closing in on her from all ends. She is literally introduced into the series as a puppet in the nefarious plans of Luthen by stating this aloud. They're everywhere. There's a new spy every day at the Senate. I visit the bank. They're all new faces. I feel under siege. In offering anonymous donations to Luthen's work, she has no control over or understanding of the full weight of what she is helping fund. Luthen intentionally leaves her in the dark at every turn, almost to the point of alienating her entirely, as he has no sympathy for the sacrifices she makes, while attempting to pick up the pieces of her life crumbling all around her. Mon seems to be the most isolated character in the series, with nobody she can really rely on or trust, with the rare exception of her friend, Tay Colma, but even he can't save her from the inevitable consequences of her own actions. She is secretly helping move pieces into place on behalf of the Rebellion, with the understanding that she may never receive any recognition for it. The Senate mocks her for attempting to maintain a semblance of democracy. Her own family, a product of an arranged marriage founded on outdated ideologies from her homeworld that she is desperately trying to steer her daughter away from, chastises her both for caring too little and caring too much. And the person through which she moves money to fund the rebellion brushes her off entirely and treats her as expendable. Mon as a character offers a vitally important and deeply personal perspective through which we can perceive the events of the series as they unfold. As a a well-known public figure, Mon is perhaps the most exposed of any of our main characters, having to fend for herself and navigating through treason at the very heart of the Empire's grasp. Mon's theme, therefore, touches equally on both the tragic solitude and intriguing espionage of her position in the series. This is easily my favorite character theme, and it's so interesting hearing how many ways it gets reworked and played throughout the series, to focus on either end of that tone for her theme as appropriate. In her quietest and saddest moments, where we are treated to nothing more than shots of her in deep emotional pain, and trapped in a situation no other character can save her from, we are given somber, low-toned strings. In moments where she feels most exposed and at risk, we are treated to hints from the latter half of her theme, which builds and builds with rising tension as if something is closing in on her before it suddenly ends with nothing but a haunting, scream-like tone carrying through to the end, almost as if the life is slowly but surely being choked out of her. And of course, this is all done deliberately and holds in line perfectly with her tendency to remove the collar from around her neck and take a deep breath, as she feels she is constantly being suffocated by the various forces pressuring her from all ends. And so what about that scrappy rascal Cassian? 
Well, as we established earlier, the man has everyone outbeat by a long shot with a whopping 12 themes. Of course, this makes sense with him being the title character of the series, and so naturally hints of the themes are sprinkled throughout the score using it as the foundation. But if we listen to and break down Cassian's theme and how it is used throughout the series, what does it tell us? Well, in order to do this, we first have to come to the understanding that the story of Cassian is the story of Andor as a series, and so the development and reuse of his theme and aspects of it seeps into the very fabric of the narrative itself. Which brings me to the final section of this musical analysis. The final aspect of brilliance in Andor's music that I wanted to touch on is the significance of the synergy between the music and what's happening on screen. Oftentimes, through both diegetic and non-diegetic means, music is used to drive a scene forward or even tell a story of its own. The most obvious and memorable example of this of course being the funeral march on Ferrix in the final episode. A truly brilliant use of diegetic music where the music is quite literally the motivator behind the scene and everything else is worked around it. Brittel wrote a compelling and fitting arrangement for a funeral held in remembrance of a beloved community member, led by a tight-knit group of traditionalists that we as the audience would have every reason to believe, this as being something the locals on Ferrix would do, based on previous establishments of the setting. The music starts slow and sorrowful, even going so far as to show the band warming up and preparing their instruments as the locals gradually gather from all ends of the town to honor Marva. It then rapidly increases in tempo, reflecting the group's march toward the Imperial perimeter, as this moment remains just as much a show of force and resilience by the locals of Ferrix as it is a funeral march, led in the spirit of Marva who undoubtedly had hoped for what would then follow to occur. What an exceptionally fitting way to honor the memory of a beloved character in a way that feels organic to the environment it takes place in, while also employing an exceptionally innovative use of editing to progress both the narrative and the music in perfect synchronicity. When I first watched this scene, I was simply blown away by the attention to detail and coordination that must have gone into making this scene a reality, and how perfectly executed it turned out in direct contrast with the alternate approach I was expecting, where all the residents of Ferrix just started storming out of their homes and attacking the Imperial forces with no real buildup. The funeral march and Marva's speech immediately following provide a phenomenal culmination of all that came before, making use of music to construct a scene that lends a great deal of respect to the prior investment spent on developing Ferrix and its inhabitants as memorable parts of the series. And yet, as brilliant a showcase of Andor's music as this scene is, it is only one of many, which brings us back to how music is used to accentuate the telling of Cassian's story. The roots of his theme carry throughout all of his major life events depicted in the series, while also taking on meaning of their own. For example, in episode 3, a particularly memorable piece of music named Mirror begins to play as Cassian slowly begins to stare into the reflective glass aboard the Republic frigate that crashed on Canari, wherein he is presumably able to see his own reflection for the first time in his life. The frustration of the situation he has found himself in and what it means for him and his tribe, as well as the terrifying uncertainty of what's to follow, triggers a reaction of pure carnal rage as he begins to destroy the ship, followed by a jump cut to present day on Ferrix, beautifully complemented at the exact moment of the cut by a sudden swelling of strings resembling the arrangement used in the main theme of the series. Episode 3 ends with a really strong montage of cutting between Cassian's past on Canari and his present situation now fleeing from Ferrix, attempting to draw a narrative parallel between them, and as such, it requires an equally strong piece of music to tie it all together. The aptly named 
Past Present Suite track does just that, by fusing scattered pieces of Cassian's theme song together into a fully realized extension of it that feels equal parts tragic and triumphant, a fitting end given where the Origins arc closes here. Shortly thereafter in Episode 4, we're treated to a track titled I Came For You, which not only builds upon Cassian's theme, but also offers an alternate rendition of the Mirror track which, in this context, is just as fascinating narratively or metaphorically as it is musically. The title I Came For You is a reference to Luthen mentioning that he didn't come to Ferrix to purchase scrap, but rather was in search of Cassian, in the hopes that he could serve as a vital asset to the Rebellion. If you'd allow me to get a bit meta-analytical for a moment, one could potentially interpret the selective reuse of the signature arrangements from Mirror in I Came For You as a means of illustrating how Luthen, during this scene, is, in a manner of speaking, casting a reflection upon Cassian, similar to the one on that Republic frigate all those years ago. In being an expert at presenting himself entirely different from who he is beneath the surface, Luthen has developed an adept ability to understand a person on a deeper level. Luthen unearths Cassian's long-buried fears, uncertainties, and motivations, and casts them back onto Cassian as a means of reminding him of who he really is. Luthen knows what truly drives Cassian, and precisely why he will eventually agree to join the cause. And Cassian can do nothing except stare into the void as he contemplates the inevitability of his past that he attempts to ignore right up until his mother's death. Since, after all, his greatest fear lies in the potential loss of free will or having to face a situation that he lacks the ability to fully control. What would we be stealing? The quarterly payroll for an entire Imperial site. Later on in the series, when Cassian arrives on Miamos in Episode 7, there is yet another brilliant use of narrative-driven music with a pairing of tracks Tourists Don't Run and Six Year Sentence. Tourists Don't Run is a fun, upbeat sort of chase sequence piece of music that plays while Cassian is following the seemingly innocent men being chased by Imperial shore troopers. The execution of the scene paired with a choice of music attempts to trick the viewer into thinking this will be little more than an entertaining diversion or opportunity for a laugh only to immediately whiplash us into the harsh reality of Imperial overreach, as Cassian is arrested for no apparent reason. Cassian's vacation is cut almost laughably short as he is dragged into court while the six-year sentence track plays, and it absolutely nails the surrealism that naturally goes with being on the shores of a vacation destination one second to being handed down a six-year prison sentence the next. A trippy stinger gives way to rising tension that crescendos to a sense of crushing doom. As Cassian comes to realize the full weight of the situation he has now suddenly found himself in. The rapid contrast between both states of being for Cassian are perfectly captured along these two tracks, in a way that could not be properly captured by simply handing a composer a list of notes regarding the general feeling or tone the scene is intended to convey. And finally, in episode 11, when Cassian learns of his mother's passing, the profoundly memorable shot of him staring into the sunset in absolute disbelief is complemented by a rather bluntly named track titled Your Mother is Dead, which features nothing more than deeply effective and achingly haunting strings, highlighting motifs from the various themes featured at the start of each episode. The climactic event of Marva's passing, inherently, carries with it the very foundation of the series, in its music, and is powerful in its raw and palpable rumination on the importance of how this would go on to profoundly impact Cassian and, by extension, the course of the series itself. An iconic moment where you can see through his own eyes Cassian's realization of the inevitability of the war and how imprisonment under Imperial authority prevented him from being able to visit the one person he promised he would return to see. These are just a few examples of how much time and energy was placed into ensuring that direct connection between the visual and auditory ends of the series. To recognize them all would be impossible, as Brittell imbued his work here with so much more forethought than I or likely anyone as an outsider could ever fully comprehend. 
And so, as we step back and take all of these elements of the brilliance in Andor's music into consideration, what is it that this perfect culmination of creative ingredients provides us with when actually watching the series? It's one thing to take the time to analyze a score to this extent and try to derive meaning from it as I did, but for the average viewer just watching the show once over, how does Brittel's visionary approach to creating the score for the series enhance the overall experience? And how does it set such a high standard that now listening to the music in other TV series, I often find myself feeling as though they don't even compare? I believe the primary reason behind this that we touched on earlier is how the music was written specifically with a creative vision for the series in mind. The series itself and its music were quite clearly written in tandem and built together from the ground up. Every use of music in the series feels intentional and purposeful, as opposed to just having music in a scene out of necessity. Although it carries with it hints of classic Star Wars arrangements, the score is mainly comprised of an entirely unique soundscape that is explicitly bound to the story being told in the series, instead of attempting to emulate or pull from the past. And for a series founded on telling its own original story, unbeholden to the familiar trappings of literally every other Star Wars media property, this approach was highly beneficial, if not necessary, in establishing this series as a fresh take on the universe. Instead of composing a scattered series of arrangements created in a vacuum, with the intention of serving the needs of one specific scene and nothing more, great care was put into ensuring consistency between tracks that would serve as subtle reminders and linkages between different parts of the series. Regardless of the point we find ourselves in the narrative while watching, the music helps ground us and remind us of what came before. It establishes presence for an important character, gives us a sense of place in a new environment, and even occasionally commands us through entire scenes or between scenes. It is the lifeblood that flows through the veins of this endlessly creative endeavor, where each piece was crafted in such a way that you could listen to the soundtrack entirely stand alone, and still be taken back through the journey of the series all over again and even pick up entirely different meanings and interpretations along the way. Rattel's score doesn't simply telegraph to the audience how they should feel from scene to scene, reading off cues from the director on what emotions he should be reaching for. Instead, it transforms and elevates the content to carry with it deeper underlying meaning in a way that can only be conveyed through music and via means of which I see shockingly few films or TV shows take advantage of. Not a minute of purpose is wasted along the way, and every piece from the score felt like it was created because it had to be, in order to tell the full and complete story of Andor as written through music. And that is the brilliance of Andor's music. In my restless dreams, I see that show, Andor, a reflection of the potential that the Star Wars franchise could reach and aspire toward, but refuses to do so simply because it's so reliant on past fan service and nostalgia bait. Yeah, so I guess that's my weird way of telling you all that my next video on analysis is going to be focused on Silent Hill 2. Now I know there's already, you know, a million different videos out there on Silent Hill 2. It's probably one of the most saturated video games on YouTube in terms of analysis videos, but it's something that I would simply never be able to go to my grave without having covered in some capacity. It just means so much to me. So I hope if you did enjoy these two videos on Andor and my other analysis videos on my channel that you'll tune into that one and also subscribe and just stay tuned for any future analysis videos that I end up doing. I have a lot of ideas in the pipe as to what I want to cover, but as you'll see, my upload schedule is rather slow because, you know, this isn't a job that I'm doing. I don't monetize any of my content. I am purely motivated by creative passion, which just kind of comes and goes depending on life circumstances and all those things. So. Thank you for your patience and getting out this second part now that nobody really cares about Andor anymore. <laughs> no, I know there are a lot of people out there that still really care about this series and are passionate about it. And I hope that these two videos helped collectively convey why this is such a masterful series. I mean, I've never been passionate enough to essentially create over two hours of content 
talking about a series or a movie simply because I was so passionate about it. Obviously, the first part really took off in terms of viewership, but I didn't come back to do a second video because I thought I could hit the algorithm again and get a bunch more viewers. I don't care if anyone sees this or not. There was just so much brilliance in terms of the music and also the characters that I felt I didn't get to cover in the first part that I had to cover here. So I know that the introduction segment was a bit long-winded, especially with the comparison against uh, the Obi-Wan series, but that's really just how I envisioned it in my head. And admittedly, I had some I had some anger and really disgust with how the Obi-Wan series was carried out, especially in its music that I just had to get off my chest. And I thought that going through that series and its music was a really good jumping off point to show how Andor did everything so much better. And I think it's a fascinating contrast between the two series because they are both Star Wars media properties, and yet they are so fundamentally different in how they were created and how they were crafted in terms of their creativity. And there's a really interesting linkage between the quality of the narrative and the music in both of the series that I thought could really serve as a starting point for this video. So that's where that stemmed from. I also wanted to just quickly touch on a couple things from the first part that people had mentioned a lot in the comments. Um, obviously, you know, I'm not perfect, I make mistakes, there are going to be some things I um, cover incorrectly or mention incorrectly and go by unnoticed, and I'm glad people held, hold me accountable for that so I can be more prepared for the future and more diligent in my editing and my proofreading. Um, one of the big things that was mentioned is that, of course, Cassian's sentencing, when he gets arrested on the beach, ends up being six years, not six months. I did misstate that in the first video, and I hope I got it right in this one. So that is one thing to be aware of. I also realize now that irregardless apparently is not a word. Uh, I guess I was going my entire life believing that it was, and now it has been brought to my attention over the course of at least 500 comments mentioning that it is not a word, and apparently it is not. So I did my best to try to avoid using it in this video, hopefully it didn't slip in there. And finally I wanted to touch on Rogue One, um, a Star Wars story, the, the uh, spin-off movie that serves as sort of the sequel or what this series is leading up to. I don't think Rogue One is a bad movie, despite my kind of cheap jab at it in the beginning of the first video. I just think that Andor is kind of the epitome of what Rogue One wanted to be, but couldn't because it was being held back by corporate interests and sort of forced to be something that it really wasn't at its core. Um, you know, there was just a lot of the fan service stuff and the inclusion of the Vader scene at the end, and while all that stuff is really cool and exciting for any Star Wars fan like me to see, I could tell that the story that Rogue One really wanted to tell at its core was just kind of about the, the brutality of the war and how it was affecting people at the ground level, how it was affecting the common man. And I thought that the core of that concept at the heart of the story was really interesting, and I wish that they would have explored it more and got into that aspect of it, rather than feeling like they had to tie it into these big concepts of the Death Star and all that stuff. And I realized that, you know, the whole how did the Death Star plans get obtained was kind of the central focus of the narrative, but I feel like they could have maybe focused a bit more on that interesting core concept that Andor gets into, which is the morality of war. And I gotta say that before I watched Andor as a series, I did think that Rogue One was a very good movie, but Rogue One kind of soured on me after I watched Andor. I just kind of realized that it was just kind of a hodgepodge of ideas that were brought together to create something that wasn't all that satisfying to me. It just didn't feel fully realized. There was a lot of really cool scenes and moments and it was visually fascinating. Gareth Edwards does a really great job as a director, especially with that sense of scale and everything that was going on on the beach. But I just did not care for how the narrative carried out, and especially as compared to Andor, which I realize 
you know, you're talking about a two hour movie versus a 12 hour series, but Andor kind of gives me that confidence that Star Wars has the capability to be mature and stand alone and self serving without having to rely entirely on aspects of the past and fan service and nostalgia bait just to bring people in and serve as the foundation of the story. And I want future Star Wars properties to embrace what Andor set forth in terms of its ambition with the narrative and its originality. And with a series like Ahsoka immediately following it, I don't really get the sense that that's going to be the case, but, you know, we can hope that season two of Andor comes sooner than later, that it puts a good message out there as to what fans are really looking for, and can continue to be embraced as the masterpiece that it is. And I guess we'll see how this all resolves in season two, and we'll see what the quality of that season is like and whether or not I end up doing another video on it. So stay tuned, stay subscribed, and I hope to talk with you all again soon.